Hello everyone, this is Kristen McPhee. I am a nutritionist and clinical herbalist in Marquette, Michigan. And this workshop is on nutritional and herbal support for students. So the first thing that I would recommend for a student is to balance your carbohydrates. And that's because most Americans consume far too many carbohydrates and far too many of them are refined, meaning that the germ and bran have been removed from the, the grain and so a lot of nutrients are lost in that process. You also lose a lot of fiber, so most Americans are very low in fiber and consuming far too much sugar. And much of that sugar is in the form of refined carbohydrates. So aim to reduce your carbohydrate intake. Um, by doing so you'll increase your fiber and you'll also reduce your sugar. So I recommend this as a starting point because, um, you know, when you have a lot of refined carbohydrates and sugar throughout your day, that's going to cause your insulin to peak quite drastically. And then when your insulin starts to drop, um, so does your blood sugar, and you'll start to feel really spacey and tired. And it makes that hard. That's not conducive to a to learning and studying. So. Um, one way to kind of do this is to become familiar with the glycemic index and glycemic load approach. And there's a lot of recipe books and resources out there on this, um, but the glycemic index measures the rate of blood sugar from any particular food, and the glycemic load measures the quantity. So a food might be um, have a high glycemic index, but the proportions for the glycemic index might be six cups of carrots. And so it's not likely that someone's gonna consume six cups in one sitting. So it's good to cross compare the two. Um, and down below you can look at what is considered low, medium, and high for each. So a glycemic index that's under 55 is considered low and a glycemic load that is under 10 is considered low. So you want to find foods that are closer to the low end and then use the medium um, foods in uh, moderation. And here's an example chart. It's oversimplified. Um, you can find ones online or in books that are much, much more detailed. But just as a starting point, so your ideal foods are in the low glycemic index and glycemic load category in the upper left. And then as you go to the outside on both edges, those are foods that you'd want to steer clear of. So some interesting observations to note are that whole wheat bread is actually on the outside as having a, a high glycemic index, whereas if you see sourdough wheat bread, it's actually low, has a low glycemic index the medium glycemic load. So sourdoughs tend to have a little bit um, less of an insulin spike. And baked potatoes are actually in the red category, the highest you can get, whereas sweet potatoes are actually in the medium range in that middle, middle square, which is pretty interesting. And then the, a lot of the foods that are in the yellow boxes are, you know, refined grains and carbohydrates. And then as you go back to the, the ones that are more ideal in the blue, you'll see a lot of legumes, surprisingly some fruit, which is nice, um, all brand cereal. So those are kind of your ideal foods. And if you're thinking right now, um, well, what am I going to eat if, if so many of the, the carbohydrates are in those yellow categories. It's also um, worth noting that there are some alternative breads, like sprouted breads, like the Ezekiel bread, it tends to have a lower glycemic index, and so does that um, ancient grain bread that's a gluten-free bread that you'd use. So you want to also aim to eliminate sugar, and that kind of ties into lowering, lowering your carbohydrate intake and doing more whole grains if you do um, consume grains at all. Um, but get used to looking at 
what ingredients are in your food. So as you look at an ingredients label, the foods that are listed first are the most abundant in that product. So if you see sugar up at the top of an ingredients label, you'd want to stay clear of that. And the same thing is true with artificial sweeteners. Um, and that's because artificial sweeteners are known to also disrupt insulin levels. They trigger hunger signals, reduce lean muscle mass, and affect growth hormone levels. So they do a lot of um, negative things to our body, just like sugar does. And sugar and artificial sweeteners are in a lot of foods. Aspartame is in over 5,000 products nationwide. So, and it's not just the name sugar. There's a lot of different words that are also different forms of sugar to, to be mindful of and familiar with. So if you're thinking right now, that's going to be really hard for me to maintain is drastically reducing my sugar intake. I, I would say that if you want to have some sugar in your diet, you can do front concentrated fruit juices. Um, monk fruit also has a zero glycemic index. Stevia is zero glycemic index as is xylitol. And then the other more natural sugar forms that are less processed would be a raw honey maple syrup and blackstrap molasses and they have a glycemic index between 30 and 55 so they are on the low end as long as you continue to have a small quantity of them and they all have some nutritional benefits to them so those are options in 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 uh, moderation and then the last thing i'd say about carbohydrates is some of them can support healthy brain gut function. There's a lot of research on if you have a healthy GI system, then your, your mental state will be much healthier as well. And so a way to support a healthy gut through food is consuming ample of fructooligosaccharides, such as onions, burdock, asparagus, garlic, chives, and Jerusalem artichoke. And those types of carbohydrates act as a pre prebiotic, meaning that they actually enter the large intestine, whereas most other carbohydrates will not. And the, um, the beneficial bacteria that resides in our gut is able to feed off of those foods. That's like their snack. And so you're promoting um, growth of beneficial bacteria. It's sort of a, uh, a food-based prebiotic um, that has sort of a therapeutic effect. And non-starch polysaccharides can have that effect too. And those are just through fruits, vegetables, mushrooms, flaxseed, and pumpkin seeds. And, you know, if you increase your vegetable intake in particular, um, then that's going to have a lot of benefits to your GI system as well. And hopefully your, your mental state and help you um, and support you through studying and things like that as a student. So the next one is balancing fat. So I'm, I'm focusing on two of the three major macronutrients. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about protein. Um, the standard American diet has an omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, somewhere between, between 10 to 1 and 20 to 1. Humans evolved from a 1 to 1 ratio. So our... our um, ancestors were eating closer to a one-to-one, -one, and the recommended ideal range is between a one-to-one -one and a four-to-one. So we're quite far from that, meaning that we're consuming a lot of omega-6s, and that's mostly in the form of meats, because Americans, unlike much of the rest of the world, are consuming large quantities of meat. Uh, men consume over 100% of the recommended daily allowance, and women are consuming on average over 40%. And there's about 700 million people worldwide who aren't getting enough protein. So I think knowing those facts, at least for me, helps kind of put it in perspective. And to sort of practice in solidarity of the rest of the world is um, moderating your meat consumption. And if you choose to have meat as a source of protein, um, have good quality meat and um and a variety of different proteins. So you're getting a variety of amino acids. So 
I kind of went off on talking about proteins, but hopefully that's okay. I said I wouldn't. Um, fats, in, fats in general will support your central nervous system in your brain. Um, they also have a major role in, in thyroid support, adrenal support, any of our hormones, particularly as it relates to women. And just energetically, fats are very grounding, right? They're kind of heavy and nourishing. And so if you're kind of a thready, wiry um, college student who feels a lot of stress and anxiety, Increasing your fat intake can be really, really helpful and nourishing for that kind of constitution. And the, the image in the lower right is just a reminder of the different macronutrients and how they affect um, our blood sugar levels. So consuming a carbohydrate in general will cause an immediate peak of blood sugar and then that crash, which cause a lot, causes fatigue and brain fog and things like that. Proteins in the middle, it does have an effect on blood sugar, not nearly as much as carbohydrates. And when they are eaten in excess, they do break down into glucose, just like carbohydrates, and can be stored as fat. And fat actually has very little effect on blood sugar at all. It's a very calorie-dense macronutrient and um, kind of a dense dense food to, to consume and very very stabilizing. Okay, so this is a visual of the two essential fatty acids that we all need to consume. So we do need omega-6 fatty acids. We also need omega-3 fatty acids. As I said, Americans are consuming far too many omega-6 fatty acids in the form of meat and also a lot of vegetable oils as well as safflower oil. And omega-6s, they have an effect on the body that can be inflammatory and also anti-inflammatory. The inflammatory state is good because if we have um, an injury or something like of that nature, it can help repair our, our tissues very quickly. And so it kind of um, acts fast in that, in that way. And, and when we need an inflammatory state, we have the ability to recover from something like that. Omega-3s are only anti-inflammatory. And we're very low in omega-3 intake because most of us don't consume a lot of fish. The RDA for fish is 7 to 10 ounces per week. And we're, I would say in general, most of us are lucky if we eat fish once a week. So we're not getting enough seafood um, and fish into our diet. We're not getting enough green leafy vegetables. And generally, we're not eating flax and chia seeds, walnuts on a regular basis. We're more prone to eating maybe peanuts or cashews or something like that. Um, it is nice to get some of your omega-3s through seafoods and fish. Um, algaes are really wonderful, too, if you're vegan or vegetarian. And that's because they're just more bioavailable because that EPA and DHA content is has to go through fewer steps to metabolize and make it make the omega-3 available to the body. So that's nice. And also the DHA and EPA have profound effects on, on just stabilizing our moods. Um, they can be really helpful to supplement with omega-3s through the winter if you struggle with seasonal depression. Also DHA can be really helpful with, um, it's kind of calming in nature, so it can help people in particular who have like a bipolar or manic um, state. And DHA really supports our neurological health um, and needs to be emphasized. So it's found that DHA is actually attached to 35% of our cells in our brain. And that, that's because we need them to help us improve cognition. And, it, and when the DHA is present in our brain cells, it also blunts cortisol. So if you're really stressed, like say through final exam week, um, it will help kind of buffer that effect of the cortisol from your being pumped out of your adrenal glands. And here's the, um, an image just emphasizing again the importance of fish fish in our diet. So the, the fish you'd like to focus on are typically kind of oilier fish um, and they would be in the upper right hand corner. 
So if you're one that likes the small fish, they're, they're also lower in mercury content, which is good to be mindful of, like sardines, herring, and anchovy. Um, and then salmon is pretty pretty good source of omega-3s as well. So those are kind of your ideal fish. And I said, as I said, um, 7 to 10 ounces per week of a low mercury fish is, is ideal. But if you're not able to consume that much, then you may want to consider supplementing with a cod liver oil or something like that. And I'm going to touch on cooking oils only because it's, impo it's important to know that if you're buying a cooking oil, the best sources are olive oil and probably second to that are sesame oil. But you want to make sure that you have um, unrefined oil and cold pressed oil. And if you see both of those things on the label, then you are certain that you can be certain that the vitamin E is still available because it hasn't been stripped out by or broken down by processing and heating. So you need vitamin E. It's a very vital antioxidant that supports cognition. Um, and there's been a number of clinical studies that show that vitamin E supplementation actually slows and prevents Alzheimer's and dementia. And um, the only other thing I want to mention is sesame oil actually is a pretty good balance of monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats. And polyunsaturated fats generally should not be heated because they're very unstable and they will go rancid. And then you're actually consuming rancid oil that causes oxidative damage. Sesame oil is unique because you can heat it and the fat balance is preserved by a... Um, antioxidant called um, sesamol. So you have that and if you if you're tired of olive oil and you want to just have more more variety in your diet then that would be a good way to go too. Sesame oil in Ayurveda too is also very grounding for people who tend to be thinner framed, thready, wiry, more of a vata type constitution. So we've talked about carbohydrates, we've talked about fats, and now I just wanted to touch on B vitamins. That would be the third thing that I would recommend for students. And that's because as our stress load increases, we, we tend to use up more B vitamins. And there are 13 different types of B vitamins found in foods, and that is the best way to consume them. Um, foods mostly uh, whole grains, would be a big source of, of B vitamins. Um, but nutritional yeast is a really great kind of seasoning that you can buy and it, that is packed full of B vitamins. A lot of vegans and vegetarians are familiar with it because it's high in B12. Um, and it, it has sort of a cheesy flavor to it, but it's very mild. And I tend to sprinkle it on salads. You could put it in soups or on vegetables. I've used it as a cheese substitute to make kind of a vegan pesto. So I'm sure if someone did a, a quick internet search, you'd find all sorts of in interesting recipes on what to do with nutritional yeast. But that's a great B vitamin supplement and the source of food. And um, deficiencies of B vitamins, as I said, are, are common with people who are under a lot of stress. They're also common if you have a higher carbohydrate diet, which many of us do, or if you're on birth control pills that can deplete your B vitamins. And if you just start having, if you're not having a healthy gut flora and able to absorb and assimilate your nutrients properly, that could cause a deficiency. And you may want to, you may know if you have a deficiency or if that's a possible cause if you're experiencing fatigue, irritability, nervousness, depression, insomnia, constipation, acne. And another great one to just monitor is if you start to get kind of irritations on the corners of your mouth, that can, that can be a really great sign of uh, B vitamin deficiency. And these are just a couple sample ideas that I would recommend for a brain healthy breakfast. So 
it's really taxing on your body to consume a high, a refined carbohydrate, sugary based um, breakfast. That's a very difficult way to start off our day. And most of us, as you know, when we're raised as children, we eat cereal for breakfast. And many of those are high in sugar and, and low in fiber. And so I'd like to kind of get away from the dependency we have on eating cereal for breakfast and look at more simple yet nutrient-dense foods that you could consider. So the first one I would say is to just do a sprouted grain type of bread, like the Ezekiel bread, and then some source of fat. I love avocados, but some people can't stand them, or they're not in season. You could also use a good quality mayonnaise or, a, or just a, a um, butter. And then add some leafy greens on there. So that's an omega-3 source and vitamin K source, calcium. Onion and garlic would be good, which would offer you some fructo-oligosaccharides. And then if you could do a smoked fish or canned herring is actually quite good. It's not fishy tasting at all. And that would be a really great breakfast. The other one is just to do, if you are wanting to do something that's more of a cereal type, you could do a, a, a very low sugar, whole grain, nutrient dense type of porridge, like steel cuts oats or oatmeal, all bran. You, you could use an ancient grain like oatmeal or millet. And then you could add in some omega-3 rich seeds and some berries if you wanted to have like some natural sweetener. And then I like unsweetened vanilla yogurt because it's then you're getting some probiotic support through a medicinal yogurt, basically. You could also just do milk. The other one is just making a smoothie. And I this isn't a recipe, but this is sort of the ingredients that I gravitate towards for my morning smoothies. Is I, I'll use a yogurt base that has zero sugar and lots of fat. Maybe some blueberries. And then flax seed. You want to make sure the flax seed is fresh or soaked o either soaked overnight or ground in the blender so it doesn't go rancid. A good quality nut butter. I'd steer clear of peanut butter because it's higher in omega-6s, so anything else would be good. A spirulina is really wonderful. It's high in B12 and a great vegetarian source of protein. Um, high in chlorophyll and has a number of B vitamins. It's a really kind of superfood that you can sprinkle in there. It's an algae. So you could do something like that. Those are just examples. I'm sure there's many, many more and many more creative ones. And then I've got two herbs that I would uh, like to touch on. So one of them is guarana, which probably people recognize the name from seeing on the label of a lot of energy drinks. And that's because guarana is a natural source of caffeine. The, the seeds naturally are caffeinated, and that's mostly what's in them, although there's a number of other constituents. Um, the scientific name is Paulinia cupana. Uh, another common name is Brazilian cocoa. And it grows in the Amazon region of Brazil and Venezuela. And it's used as an alternative to caffeine or to coffee and tea. And the onset tends to be a little bit gentler and the effects tend to last a little longer. The beneficial effects when I that's what I mean when I say that. And so it is a bit stimulating and, and when when you do consume it as a lower dose, it actually is more efficacious than consuming it in large quantities. So you really don't need very much. And it helps to improve cognition, alertness, task performance that's been proven in clinical trials, efficiency with work, and also memory, attention span, and mood. So those are, you can see how all of those actions can tie into the life of a student. And then the precautions are mostly related to um, you know, the same precautions as as coffee would be. So just to be mindful of those possible contraindications. If you're not a coffee drinker and coffee doesn't make you feel well, then this might be, might not be the herb for you, but you could always try a gentle low dose just to see. And let's see. Um, the, uh, 
recommended daily doses on there. Um, you don't want to exceed three grams, so you can go pretty high. Um, but a lower dose is actually proven to be better, more beneficial. So it's something that you kind of want to use sparingly and have appreciation for and, and not kind of abuse by trying to get a, a super caffeine kick off of. The other one is more of uh, an herb that originates in, I believe, Asia. And it's used a lot in Ayurvedic medicine. It's called Bacopa. The scientific name is Bacopa manieri. And another common name for it is Brahmi. And this one you actually use the entire plant. And it grows kind of as a creeping succulent. Um, and overall, it's just a great cerebral tonic. So it has a number of effects on the brain um, while being calming instead of stimulating, like the guarana. So it improves cognition, memory, concentration, mental performance. It's really supportive for uh, people who have ADD and ADHD. And then it's also calming. So it kind of comforts your nervous system and insomnia and anxiety. So if you're under a lot of stress, that can be helpful. And they're actually starting to consider this herb as an adaptogen, which means that an adaptogen is used for um, building up your body's own resiliency to stress, obviously with some lifestyle balance uh, ingrained as well. But it can help make you, if you're naturally very susceptible and sensitive to stress, it can be great for helping to manage that, really supportive. Um, there's not a lot of precautions. It's very saponin rich, so there is some um, contraindications if someone has GERD, which I wouldn't anticipate with many college students, and also um, dialysis just because it's very rich in potassium. So those are the, the two herbs that I think would be really wonderful for students. There's a, a lot of them out there that are great, but those are the two I wanted to focus on. And I'll just, in the next slide, I'll explain how I would use them. And this is sort of the like kitchen sink cookie for herbalists, our energy balls. And you can kind of use your own creativity and intuition to make a build a recipe. Um, but you would add in your pow the herbs as a powdered form into a base. And you can add in um, things like a powdered pumpkin seed, which is really great for fiber and omega-3. Spirulina, which is just very nutrient dense and high in protein. A sesame butter would be nice. Sesame butter blended with honey tastes really good, actually. And then some almonds and then whatever else you want. I kind of like to make mine a little bit chocolatey. So you could use cacao or carob or coconut, things like that, chocolate chips. Um, don't go overboard with the sweets, but um, they can kind of help balance some of the herby flavors you get when you add in things like the copa and guarana, especially if you're not used to the taste of different herbs. So you would just make these you, and uh, roll them into balls, and then you put them in your refrigerator and or freezer, I suppose, and then you just take them, when you go to the library to study in the afternoon or evening, you can take two of them, keep in your backpack, and pull those out as a snack. And they, because of the actions of the copa and grana, in addition to just a great blend of a lot of healthy um, proteins and fats, the, the, it makes a great snack um, for, for a student who needs to study pretty hardcore. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's a recommendation on how to use those, those herbs. And then this is sort of my role. I do practice clinically in Marquette as a nutritionist and herbalist. So when I see a client, um, I spend a large amount of time at the initial in um, consultation and providing an assessment of individualized um, short and long-term plans. And that includes doing a tongue diagnosis and energetic assent assessment, potential drug herb and or herb, nutrient interactions, primary concerns. Um, they do a comprehensive intake form, and I look at all of their current lab work. So my assessment's based on a lot of that. I also would do a nutritionist physical exam, which isn't included in this slide. Um, and then we would develop goals together on how to proceed working towards optimum health and wellness. 
And then I, uh, I integrate customized dietary and lifestyle recommendations that kind of support your body in bringing itself into balance. And after that, we've kind of laid the foundation through diet and lifestyle. We'll start to offer interventions with supplements and herbs as needed. Um, and I work with a number of conditions. I, I specialize in women's health and Lyme disease, but I see clients who are undergoing cancer who are recovering from cancer, who have autoimmune diseases, who need support with weight loss, um, all sorts of things. So if you're interested, you can always go to my website and read more about it. It's just www.kristenmcphee.com. And um, please contact me if you have any questions or concerns, too, in the meantime. Okay, thank you.